Whoa, this is a big group. I'm not used to talking to so many people at one time, but we'll get through this. Uh, actually, I have fun. This is probably one of the more fun parts of the research that I do. And by the way, Duane is, in some respects, is wrong because I'm a graduate of Montana State University, not North Dakota State. Well, you know, Ruth was in a hurry. She probably had to do half your work, too. <laughs> At any rate, uh, let's get going. Uh, time is limited because I do have quite a few slides here. Uh, a lot of information, lots of pictures. You'll notice as we go forward that I use lots of pictures. I like pictures because they're worth a thousand words and more, so I don't have to do all the talking. You can see for yourself. Uh, the first thing I want to do is to thank these sponsors that are here today for your meeting because they're paying my expenses, so I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, the title of our talk today is Grazing Synergy and Regenerative Agriculture, Crop Grazing, Microbial Soil Health and Greenhouse Gas Emissions. Uh, you probably haven't heard too much about greenhouse gas emissions except that the, the sky is falling from all the liberals that are on uh, social media and whatever. but. Uh, we're still going to be around, even though they're worried about everything. I think the earth has been warming since the ice age. Have you noticed that? Yeah. Well, it's continuing. Humans are just accelerating it a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> with that in mind, uh, I, am, uh, <clears throat> I am Doug Landblom, an a animal scientist from Turkey has been working with me for about seven years. Larry Chahachik is a soil scientist out of NDSU. <clears throat> and so. The three of us and some other folks are uh, working on this particular long-term research. It's a 10-year project. Next uh, summer we will, or this summer coming, I guess we're already in 2019, we will plant our ninth crop in this 10-year project. So we've been at it for a while. I might add that as we, <clears throat> as we move forward here, some of the things I want to talk are about soil health. But in the beginning, well, let me not get there yet. In terms of soil health, we want to look at these five principles. Now, if you're an agronomist, you look at these four and you stop here. You don't know that livestock exists. But we cattle guys, we know that livestock integration plays a huge role in soil health. And so we want livestock, if we can, we want to have livestock in the, in the equation. We want to have of course, we want soil armor. We want to minimize soil disturbance. We're doing that by using no-till. We want a lot of diversity in our crops, so we have wide crop rotations, continual live plant root in the ground. We use cover crops to help us do that, and we in integrate livestock into our system. And so we have three points in this triangle. The three primary points, as you can see there, are uh, crop rotations, soil health, and livestock grazing, and they interact between each other in an integrated systems work that I'm working on. If you take a look here, we have a study going on, and what we have in this piece of research is we have spring wheat grown continuously year after year after year under no-till. And we're comparing that basically to spring wheat grown in a five crop rotation. And this rotation includes cover crops after the wheat, which precedes corn. Corn precedes a field pea barley, followed up by sunflowers. In that rotation, there are the four crop types. There are your two warm season. You have your broadleaf and grass type warm season crops. You have your broadleaf and grass type cool season crops, and so we want those four crop types in there. And they're placed in that rotation uh, intentionally the way they are because in our cover crop, we're trying to use a cover crop that has a carbon-nitrogen ratio somewhere in that, let's say, 35 to 45 uh, CN ratio, which will break down more rapidly, okay? If we have one that is high, let's say corn residue, sunflower residue, those are more lignified, those heavy stalks, and you can see in your own fields they break down uh, more slowly, okay? So we, we, what we have here is we have these more rapid breakdown crops. Here's peas and, and barley, they break down quite rapidly. So they're preceding the higher nutrient requirement crops, such as corn, 
and sunflower in that rotation. And the rotation gives us diversity. Okay, I think I'm driving a cameraman nuts, but that's okay. So we asked the question, why seed a cover crop? And been lots of discussion about cover crops. And we just talked about it earlier, but minimum disturbance using no-till seeding, livestock involved providing crop diversity, maintaining a living root. So we prevent erosion, we increase soil organic matter, we increase soil nutrient cycling, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, we reduce fertilizer inputs, we produce forage for haying and or grazing in this situation. If you looked, if you remember what we had, now you have the handout, so it isn't in color, but um, you can see here, after we uh, harvest that spring wheat, we come in behind that about the 15th of September and we seed winter triticale hairy vetch. It could be winter rye. I happen to have selected winter uh, triticale at the time and so we continue on through. If it were today, I would probably, in research, you can't make quick changes, I would change to winter rye. But that's neither here nor there today. After that winter rye the next spring, by about mid-June, we swath that down, roll it up for hay and come back behind. Uh, burn it down, seed a cover crop, and then we graze that cover crop either with cows or yearling steers in the, in the fall, okay? So that's what happens in terms of a cover crop uh, procedure after spring wheat, okay? So it's a multi-cover crop really with the winter crop followed by a summer crop. So it's a dual cropping system and it gives us a fair amount of tonnage uh, in total with the cover crop hay as well as grazing. If you take a look at the amount of uh, tonnage, uh, cover crop seeded in this particular manner, in other words, not being a full season cover crop, but one that follows a spring uh, grain crop in that situation. You'll notice that in 2011, here's your years along here, uh, 11 through 17, I don't have 18 on the chart, but what you'll notice is you've got a year in 2011, you've got 2014, you got 2017, those were very low production years. Now in 14, uh, we had a tremendous amount of rain, okay? A lot of rain in, in our area, Un unbelievable. And so I think that the cover crop species that we had selected, a lot of them don't like wet feed because it was really wet. And that's one of the reasons we think that we got such a low response in a real high moisture year because of the crops we had. This is drought and this is exceptional drought over here in 17. Otherwise, running around four and a quarter, three and a quarter, 292, five ton to the acre. This is dry matter tons to the acre. So on a wet basis, you'd have to calculate that up. Cover crop mix. So the cover crop mixes in this case, cover crop mixes can be, oh, from five to, in this case, I think there's 12 or 13 species in there. Uh, a lot of times I use a small amount, like in this case of these clovers, they're expensive, so there's only seven tenths of a, a percent or a third of a pound per acre. Just a small amount, and the goal is to get a lot of root diversity in that cover crop as we, as we seed that. So in this case, we're seeding about 43 pounds per acre. One of the challenges we have with cover crop is, is increasing diversity in the number of species, but trying to keep the price down, and they can get, they can get expensive, and so you know, you're challenged with uh, getting a return on your investment, okay? After five years of uh, spring wheat, taking a look at the control wheat, versus the wheat grown in rotation. If you look at those charts, you'll see that there's a trend line here that's going this way in the control. Trend line in the rotation wheat, though, is going this way. And then I'll tell you that at this point in the, in the study with the control wheat, our soil test said after this year we no longer needed fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer. However, in our soil test in the rotation, our soil, our soil test said that we no longer needed fertilizer here. So from 2013, 14, and 15, there was no nitrogen fertilizer applied. In this case, 14 and 15, no fertilizer applied. And as we took fertilizer away, 
Look what happened to the yields. This is a product of the microbial mineralization taking place. In other words, the, nutri the microbes in the soil are, are mineralizing nitrogen, making it available to the plant as plant food. And this here we have, you know, you've got your 14 bushels difference in yield per acre of spring wheat in that situation. If I look at all of the crops that were grown, and I, there's a lot of slides I could have in here, this talk, I have about 100 slides, and so you only get 35 today. Um, this is the five-year net return. I have all those numbers that support these things, but you don't have time for that. But notice here, between the spring wheat control and the spring root rotation, in terms of net return, is about a $15 per bushel when I took a look at the five years, over the five years, the, of markets and prices and yields and costs, et cetera, in that particular uh, situation. And seeing that sunflower is our highest net return crop in this situation. If we look at, uh, if we look at, I have to change hands. My, I have carpal tunnel and this one goes to sleep, so I might drop the microphone. But uh, <clears throat> if you look at these two charts, the chart on the left is the control of the wheat, and what you have on there are three lines, and the three lines represent, if you can see, uh, the blue is the cropped area, the orange is a, a root restricted area, and the gray happens to be native pasture under similar range sites. The orange line is a situation where we took uh, eight inch aluminum irrigation pipes, eight inch by 24 inch, and we pushed them into the ground, into the soil with a payloader, so that there was maybe about this much sticking out of the top of the, above the ground. Okay, so inside that curbing or that aluminum pipe, roots from the growing wheat could not get in and scavenge nitrogen. Okay, so that nitrogen, whatever nitrogen was being mineralized inside that curbing was there and not being uh, released. So the difference that you see here between the blue line and the orange line is the amount of nitrogen that was being produced versus that which the crop had used. So we have this difference here. And you can see under the rotation uh, wheat grown in that five crop rotation, we have a larger amount of N being produced in, in the area, okay? These dates are like the first of June, this is October, here's about time you combine right in here, okay? Those just happen to be calendar dates. If we look at this regression, and, and uh, it's a kind of a scatter regression, and, and don't worry about that part, but you can notice the slope of our line is one in which we go from about 2.5% organic matter in our soils in the research up to not quite, what, 6 and 3 quarters, something of that nature. So we have this range. Uh, I have an aerial photograph, and I did not put it in the, uh, in the slide set, and I should have. But uh, <clears throat> what we have is a gradient of soil. As we come from, let's say, south or north to south across this, this uh, experimental area, and these are not little plots necessarily, they're about 4.3 acre fields. So they're smaller fields, and so they're large enough for me to get in and graze with yearling steers, okay? So a little bit larger. And uh, from south to north, if you think of the blocks on this floor, that's a lot like our fields are set out, and we go from quite a good soil uh, to a V-bar, sandy type soil with some sandstone uh, in the surface, so it's not very good soil as we move up. But if you'll notice, even those poorer soils are showing somewhere in that 2.5% soil organic matter. Our higher and better quality soils are up in this area of, the, of that uh, a regression line, okay? In terms of parts per million of mineralized nitrogen as it contrasts against soil organic matter, all right? In some uh, laboratory mineralization work that we've been doing with these soils, in 2014 to 16 is the time period, that three year period of soils, we are finding under ideal conditions, now I need to point that out, 
we're mineralizing about 16.8 pounds of potential mineralized nitrogen per acre as you look at this, at this particular situation. So uh, that's in the rotation versus the control, okay? So we think we're making some progress. We know we're making some progress because this is a significant amount of nitrogen being mineralized and justifies why you saw that increase in wheat yields in the rotation chart that I previously showed you back here. No, that's too far, that one. This is the effect of mineralized nitrogen that the soil microbes are, are producing. I'm going to get into Ray, Ray Ward's area just a little bit. We have done some uh, microbial analysis using uh, uh, the laboratory analysis that Ward Labs does, and, and Ray Ward is on the program later, this, later on. I'm just going to make a quick mention that this particular uh, soil samples were taken in 17 during the exceptional drought in Dickinson, and we had very poor yields, I will tell you. Uh, Given that situation, I looked at microbial biomass and they, they provide a tremendous amount of information. And so I've just uh, extracted a little bit of that information for you in three areas that I think are particularly important in, in, in a baseline uh, evaluation. We're going to take some more samples this coming summer and see how they contrast with these. In terms of biomass or the abundance of microbial presence based on uh, uh, phospholipid fatty acid content of cell walls, and all living organisms have phospholipids in their cell walls. And so it's a, it's a very good uh, indicator to use. This is in nanograms per gram of soil, but you see, and I've got the colors of the different crops here. So our highest, our highest one happens to be this darker green, which is a pea barley mix, remember, we have that in the crop system. And, and so forth. But you look at these, well actually this is the highest one which we get over here to the triticale hairy vetch. The point being is that these are up in this range of, uh, you know, 14 something to 2100 uh, nanograms per gram of soil and we would actually like to see those, I think, under, under an environment where we had adequate moisture, we would probably see 3500 to 4000. Uh, nanograms per gram of soil, okay? This is under a drought situation and when those, when that soil is almost bone dry, those organisms are unable to respire and to multiply and reproduce themselves and so as a result they, uh, we're not going to have a very large number. This particular little chart here, in terms of functional group diversity, in other words, micro the, the structure of the microbial community, and some of these words are probably like a foreign language to you. That's okay, they kind of are to me as well. But the point being is on a scale of one to two, even though we were dry and the, the total abundance or the microbial biomass wasn't, was about half of what we'd like it to see under a drought condition, the, the, uh, the complexity of the organisms in that soil is quite good because from a score of zero to two, you see these are up in that 1.5 to, to 1.6 and so a pretty decent uh, uh, diversity in the functional groups of those microbes that are in the soil and that's important, okay, because it's a balance of a variety of different things that live in the soil. And then uh, they do a soil health calculation and Ray will get into probably all of that stuff, but uh, on a range of 0 to 50, we're in that 13, 14, something like that. Uh, in their literature, they talk about 7 and above being a valuable. This is something that you look at year after year after year to see if you're seeing change in your values, okay? We won't say anything more about it than that. The other thing that they do, and something I just showed you basically based on the, uh, the amount of nitrogen that's being mineralized in the soil, this is a test that, that the laboratory does as well as we take a look at the, <clears throat> the N, P, and K cost per acre that they, that they have calculated 
Then they take a look at the nitrogen available based on microbial analysis, do the difference, and then give you a value of savings in dollars per acre of nitrogen that's being uh, mineralized in that soil, okay? And he'll go into that. And in effect, that's basically what I told you in the previous slide. And this sort of validates what, they've all, that what they are saying as well uh, from uh, Dr. La, uh, Ward's lab. Greenhouse gases. Um, we know they're an issue in society, in our environment. They are naturally occurring. Uh, some of the things we do, we would like to reduce the amount of CO2 if we could. We'd like to reduce methane if possible. And we'd like to reduce nitrous oxide. But there's a balance in nature between the environment, the atmosphere, and, and uh, rains that are, are loaded with nitrogen as it rains. Our, our crops are fertilized with nitrogen when we get a rainstorm or a thunderstorm, okay? So there's a balance in nature. <clears throat> we won't go into those cycles here today in terms of the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle, et cetera. But the point being, one of our question was, because we have grazing in our research, is what is the impact of grazing on these particular grasses, uh, these crops? Can we actually make a difference? Does grazing hurt it and cause more? Does grazing cause less, or is there no difference? And uh, <clears throat> the way we've studied that is we've taken these little static chambers, and we have a cage. You notice we had some cattle panel here around some of those chambers, and some chambers have no, there's grazing around these, and we restrict grazing around these with livestock cattle panel. I don't know if you could see those, but these little chambers are in, in there. We put some steel posts around them because the cattle play with them and they knock them out of the soil and, and we have problems. So we use steel posts to keep them from uh, damaging those, those chambers. And uh, so just let me show you that data quickly. And if I take a look at the cumulative or the total amount of, uh, of gases from grazed and non-grazed uh, sites, if you look here at carbon dioxide in terms of uh, measured in kilograms per hectare, uh, if we want that at by acre, we multiply it by 0.893 and you've got pounds per acre. But at any rate, notice here under grazed is the green bar, the ungrazed is the orange bar. We've got less carbon dioxide uh, when under grazing. In the case of methane, uh, it's about the same, really not much difference between those two. But in the case of nitrous oxide, we have a little bit less nitrous oxide where it's grazed than where it's ungrazed. Nitrous oxide is an, interesting, is an interesting gas. When we get a rain event, such as a thunderstorm, we'll see this nitrous oxide going along as we take you know, samples week after week after week. And we get a rain event, boom, they just bounce up. Those organisms just explode in activity producing a large volume of nitrous oxide uh, after that rain event. Here's something you may be interested in. I don't know if any of you are seeding uh, winter rye. How many seed winter rye? Oh, not one hand. Interesting. Okay. Well, I understand, but... Okay. Okay. Anyway, so you're not seeding winter rye. But some of our, our folks are seeding winter rye. In fact, in North Dakota, in areas where they seed a lot of soybeans, they're seeding winter rye, and then they're see green seeding soybeans into winter rye, okay? So one of our questions was, and this is just an extension demo at uh, Bowman, at the Sorority Charley uh, Ranch. Uh, we went in and set up their drill, and we seeded single rows of, uh, of a variety of crops. Uh, a radish, rape, turnip, soybeans, uh, common vetch, uh, forage peas, uh, millet, uh, triticale, flax, oats, barley, and sorghum sedan. You can see oats, barley, and sorghum sedan, no growth whatsoever. Uh, flax did well, triticale uh, didn't do quite so well. Uh, millet was one of our good growing crops. Uh, peas did well, vetch did uh, so so, and uh, so, uh, the uh, Soybeans did quite well, so they were pretty resistant to the chemical that winter rye uh, produces. It produces a chemical 
and it's a word about this long, so I won't try to pronounce it, but it inhibits uh, plant growth around it, and as you can see here, certain plants are quite, re quite tolerant, are not tolerant, they're very sensitive to it. The rape, uh, these uh, brassicas here, actually they germinated and would have done fine except flea beetles wiped them out, and as it got high the plants just dried up and was a total loss. But anyway, uh, if you're not seeding winter rye, you might think about that in some uh, cover crop type things, but it depends on what your cropping systems are and how you do things, okay? <coughs> grazing. Uh, move into a little bit of grazing and, and beef cattle because we do have, uh, we do have some, some crops. And when I, I used to feed cattle at one time, fed my own cattle or, or had cattle fed in both Wyoming and Nebraska feed yards. And I either made money on futures or occasionally I made money on the cattle, but I usually made money on the futures. Uh, you've probably had a lot of experience in doing that too. The cattle by themselves didn't make a lot of cash, okay, was what I was trying to say. So I thought to myself, now how am I, that's how I set this whole piece of research up along with some help from, from Dwayne Beck. He helped me design this project going back in 2009, 2010. And as I was feeding cattle and I was trying to think, now how am I going to make more money from these cattle? And my thought was, I need to own these cattle a lot longer. In fact, if I could own these cattle all the way to slaughter on the ranch, rather than having someone else do my work for me, I think I could probably make a little bit more money. And indeed, that's what I tried to do. So I began with yearling steers in this particular project to see if I could hold, retain ownership on those steers from birth to a carcass hanging on the rail and what kind of dollars and cents would be involved in vertically integrated business plan. Okay, I can't give you all of that data but I can give you a glimpse of it. Okay, so what we did is we began with with yearling steers great overwintered uh, to grow um, pound, pound and a half a day, pound and a quarter a day, okay, and then put them out on native pasture. They're there 108 days. Then that field pea barley, we actually swathed it for a period of time, put it into windrows, and then grazed those windrows for about a month's period of time. You can see some dollars tied to those pictures. Took those cattle then off of that pea barley when they were done grazing, and I used that sort of as a, as a link between the native pasture and the corn, but the corn wasn't quite ready. So then we put them in, in the corn, and corn, of course, doesn't stay green all the time, and they, it ends up to be very dry, uh, dry corn, and we fed a little bit of protein supplement along with that dry corn, and uh, got about $11 per steer invested in, in supplement. And then those steers uh, went onto the, onto the feed yard, and working with uh, Steve Paisley at the University of Wyoming over here at, uh, at Lingle. But going backwards, let's look at the performance on those yearling steers. They grazed for 211 days through native pasture and these annual forages, corn and uh, pea barley, okay? At that time when I was doing this particular work, I was doing some stuff with cows and I'll show you that a little bit later. Grazing cover crops. But anyway, these yearlings grazed for 211 days. They had a starting weight of 780. The ending weight of those yearlings coming off of the native uh, forages with 1,275 pounds, and you probably say to yourself, man alive would never sell an animal that heavy. Well, you would if you see the dollars. Uh, we put on 495 pounds again, it cost 300 bucks to do that. In terms of a gain and uh, cost of gains here, the, uh, the uh, grazing average daily gain was about 2.3 pounds a day, and it cost us 61 cents per pound of gain. If I look at a, at a little bit of a cash flow here for the yearlings, if we were to sell them at the end of the grazing period, which might be a, a, one of the options. And one of the options, we've got about 600, oops, $602 invested in annual cow costs, a background in cost of 153. The grazing cost per steer of $285. I adjusted that down and made some changes in some things. I showed you 300 previously. Total cost of 1040. The ending gra end grazing steer value of 1593. That was based on 
on a 1,275-pound steer at $125 a hundredweight, and uh, grazing net return per steer of $553. Uh, based on the number of acres that those animals use between native range plus the annual forage is 8.24 acres per steer, uh, we have a net return of about $70 per acre uh, from, from the cattle, okay? And those numbers are based off of what I put together yesterday. So those are, those are current dollars and cents and market values. If we do not sell those animals at the end of, of uh, end of the grazing period and carry them on to finish, we basically come from the cornfields to the feedlot to the packing plant and in the process uh, those control cattle, we put a set of steers, when we put cattle in the, on the native pastures, we put a set of steers in the feedlot at the same time. They went down in uh, early May and they were in the feedlot for 211 days. Uh, it's just circumstance that they grazed for 211 days, the other group. That wasn't by design, it just happened that way, I guess. But these grazing cattle were in the feed yard for 82 days. Pretty short period of time. If you fed cattle in the feed yard, uh, you know you'll get uh, a lot of days in the feed yard and you get, uh, you get feed bills every two weeks. Yearling steer feedlot average daily gain, you can see that uh, the feedlot control gained about 3.4 pounds a day. When these yearlings come to the feed yard, they are not growing out on those grazing fields because of the level of nutrients is not as high and it doesn't reach their genetic potential for gain and growth, okay? Just doesn't. Because a lot of these cattle, as you know, are designed and developed for corn diets. And forages are not corn diets. Even though we've grazed corn, we're grazing we're gaining about a pound and eight to 2.2 pounds a day grazing corn. Not much more than that. You'd think it'd be more, but it isn't. Anyway, when these animals get to the feed yard, they have a very high compensatory growth response. And so the efficiency is quite good because when they get there, it doesn't take nearly as many days to get them finished. And they're heavier to start with. So the feed intake is greater. If you take a look at their feedlot, uh, uh, feed intake and efficiency, our feedlot cattle that were the controls, 26.8 pounds of feed at 7.6 pounds of feed per pound of gain. If you look at the, the extended graze annual forage type cattle, they eat more feed because they're, they're larger, 29.2 pounds of feed, but their feed efficiency is what, about a pound and, uh, a pound and four tenths less per pound of gain, okay? Feed cost, 81 cents for the controls and 58 cents for our grazing cattle. If we take a look at, uh, excuse me, if we take a look at the, uh, at the carcass quality, you look here at the percent choice, steer percent choice, you'll see that there's basically no difference between those that were in the feedlot all the time versus our grazing cattle, 93 versus 92 uh, percent choice grade. We'd like to have one of those steaks for lunch, if you could make that work, uh, Ruth. I've done a couple of these experiments, and one I did when uh, the price of corn was, what, seven, eight dollars a bushel, which I guess most of you corn growers would like to see again. That ain't gonna happen. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it ain't gonna happen. Uh, anyway, during that experiment, during the high corn prices, uh, when I put the control cattle in the feed yard, I lost $298 a head. But these annual forage cattle, these grazing cattle, made $9. And uh, those that were grazing just on pasture and went through the program lost 30 bucks. So you can see the, 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 uh, the potential here in retaining ownership of those animals all the way through slaughter if that's a business plan you want to get involved in. In a second experiment, in the one I just showed you, uh, those control cattle bring $378 a head versus annual forage cattle that brought $439 net return uh, by retaining ownership all the way through. Now that, 
stream of numbers is a little bit different than if you sell those yearlings and turn around and buy them back. So if you're buying calves, selling calves, buying calves, selling calves, you will get a different stream of numbers. If you own those cattle all the way through, you don't have those buy, sell, and rebuy transactions taking place because they never traded hands. They stayed on your farm and just kept grazing. So that's why you see a set of numbers here that you swallow hard and say the guy's nuts. Actually, I am, but not in this case. Hey, Doug. Experiment one, just for my notes, that was using a uh, seven or eight dollar per bushel corn. Cost. Yeah, I think it was yeah seven fifty something like that. It was it was really high. It was when that high corn price was high and the cattle price wasn't. It hadn't exploded yet. The perfect storm occurred. A little later on, when pork prices were, pork supply, it was a protein problem when price of cattle went, shoo. that was a protein issue, and we won't see that again either, by the way. Uh, but there was avian flu, there was a swine reproduction uh, problem, and so we had a lot of pigs that didn't survive, so we had a small pork crop small chicken crop, but we had adequate beef and we were ready to go. And so that was a, it was one of those things where you bought new trailers and shops and pickups and now you're trying to figure out how to pay for them. What was the RD weight of the feedlot control? Uh, I, I can't hear. What was the marketing weight of the feedlot control animals? Marketing weight. Oh, you know, I'd have to go to the papers. I'd have to go to the data. Reasonably close, though. Reasonably close. Okay? It's just that they're in a feedlot so long, you've got all those expenses, you're up against a lot of cost of operation, is where it is. But I could get you those numbers if you'd like to see them. In fact, they're on the internet. If we could get on the computer here, we could pull them up. Is that outsourcing feed, too? Bringing outside feed in? or, or At the feed yard? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, typical. Feed yard thing and, and then a markup. Yep. You know, you know that part. Yep. Markup on everything. Drugs. Oh, if they absolutely. took a nap, markup. <laughs> they get paid well. Um, at any rate, let's enough goofing off. Uh, we took a look at these cows. Now we're working with some cows that are May June calvers. Okay. So as I look at May-June calvers, and that we could have a whole talk on calving date and all that stuff, but at any rate, as we look at uh, forages as a way to extend the grazing season without feeding quite as much hay, that was my, my goal here, was to lay, take a look at cattle that are basically in a sacrifice area being fed uh, hay pretty much through most of your winter months compared to grazing either cover crop residue or crop residue and maybe using some stockpile grasses along with some corn residue, okay? Some different kinds of things that we would see happen here because you've got a lot of grasses out in this country. In this particular part, uh, I looked at cover crop, grazing cover crop, as well as corn and sunflower residues, okay? And you can see here is our flower residue, here's some of our corn residue, so, uh, cover crop residue here with little sunflowers about as high as their back. That was when it rained that year. And uh, the other one, <clears throat> you can see here where we, we uh, basically instead of making hay, what I did was set aside those hay lands that we would have uh, swathed and baled for grazing set them as so instead of making bales, we just left it in the stand to graze and then graze corn stalks and this just picture of the stalks after we've grazed them down. And uh, so if I take a look at the cover crop mix that was in there and some of the dollars that are involved, you can see the, the crops here. It's a, what about a two, four, seven, seven crop, cover crop mix. And uh, we get down here, I got some farm, uh, I got some taxes and different expenses along with the crop itself. Cost per acre and then the cost per cow for grazing was down at 36.55, okay? This is what your crop looked like when it was green. You saw it earlier when it was frozen and dried. Days of winter grazing. Our control cows that were just on hay, of course none. 
The uh, cover crop and residue cows didn't have as much grazing time, 73 days, because they, they ate out the feed. The grass and residue I had, because I wanted to leave half and take half of the grasses, so I had twice as much grazing area. Consequently, that gave me more days of grazing uh, with, the, with the grass and residue cows there in that blue bar, so they grazed for 107 days, taking advantage of both, both the corn residue and stockpile grasses. If I look at the amount of hay that was fed per cow, uh, you can see there the red bar is the control cows. Uh, we fed them 4,724 pounds, and those are 15, 15, 1,600 pound cows, so some big girls. Uh, the hay cows, these, uh, these cover crop and residue cows, they ate a little under a ton, 1,824, and our grass and residue cows ate just a little under 900 pounds of, of hay. If I look at the hay cost for, for each cow, uh, you can, uh, understandable, our control cows were $173, down to $68 for our cover crop and residue, and then $30 for our grass and residue cows. If I put the uh, supplements, because we, uh, we did feed some, uh, some cake to those cows, uh, uh, two to three pounds a day, and we add those together, we got the taxes, we got all that stuff involved in there, uh, $209 versus $141 for our cover crop and residue cows, $73 for our grass and residue cows. So our grass, we can take, uh, as you can see, we can take advantage of that grass and uh, stockpile grass, save a little expense in, in, uh, in hay production. <clears throat> we have to balance that, I understand that. Uh, cow weight gains, you can see here that our, our cows uh, starting weights, 1490 versus uh, 1500 pounds on those cover crop and residue cows compared to grass residue about four, so those cows are pretty much about the same at the start. As we fed hay, <clears throat> our hay cows got heavier uh, compared to the other two groups of cows. And, and these grass cows <clears throat> really didn't change weight much. They put on 112 pounds, uh, and, and probably, and most of that weight is fetal membranes and fluids, actually, okay? So these cows put on a little bit more in terms of body weight <clears throat> as well. If we look at body condition score, or if you want to look at average data gain, a pound and a half versus one one versus 0.8. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in terms of starting body condition score, you see relatively little difference, 5.4 to as much as 5.7. But at the end of the body, end of the uh, grazing period, feed, grazing and feeding period, you see these, these hay cows put on a, a, a little bit, as well as the cover crop cows. But our grass and, and corn residue cows really didn't change. They didn't change from the time that we started to the end. So there's really no change in body condition score, whereas the other ones put on, oh, 78 tenths of a body condition score. If I take a look at reproductive performance, what was the effect of the grazing under those conditions? <clears throat> our first cycle uh, calving <clears throat> was less for the uh, grass and corn residue, as you would expect in the second calving cycle, they, they picked back up along with the, the cover crop ones. Uh, we had a little bit higher number of, of, uh, of third cycle cows, of course, in our uh, grass and residue group. And at the end of the period, our percent open was really no different between the control cows and the grass cows. So. Uh, I'm not sure I understand what's totally going on here. It could just be cows being cows. Uh, but you notice at the end of the day, our cover crop and our uh, crop residue cows did a little bit better. And I'm not exactly sure I understand totally what's going on there, but I think uh, it may have something to do with the amount of sunflower residue that those particular cows uh, ate. Sunflower residue is pretty high in oil. It's high in energy. Sunflower residue is a really, really good feed. 
And uh, that may have had a long-term effect on these cows, but I think it would take a more detailed study to actually identify that and, and prove it. It's just my thinking out loud, so I don't know if that's actually the case in this situation. And I think I'm done. Okay, well, thank you for listening. <laughs>